We're joined now by Cormac Healy, the Director of Meat Industry Ireland. Cormac, thanks very much for coming into us. You see there the response that the Beef Plan Group is getting around the country down in Cavan last night. And um, there's farmers there saying that they're basically on the brink, uh, that they're they're tired of the situation as it stands. They want fairness. They want good return for their products. What is your response to what's happening around the country with this Beef Plan Group at the moment? Good evening, Claire. Uh, well. Look, certainly we're aware of the of the beef plan movement and have seen the significant coverage it, it has received uh, in the media. Uh, I think many of the issues being raised, I suppose, in fairness, are on the agenda and are, are in, in uh, discussion and in, in dialogue in the sector. Uh, but I suppose, firstly, you know, it's up to farmers in terms of farm representation and it's an individual decision for farmers in, in, in how they progress and proceed in that manner. And I don't think it's for Meat Industry Ireland to uh, to necessarily be involved in that. Um, we are always open to dialogue and if there are new ideas or, or good ideas that add to the overall sector, uh, well, certainly, you know, that, that can be looked at. But what I would say, I suppose, is that, you know, one of the contentions, I suppose, uh, that, that that's out there uh, and, and part of the discussion is around the unfairness of price and the return to farmers. And I suppose what I would say to, to individual, the individual beef producer, uh, be they suckler or finisher, uh, but at the individual level is as an industry, uh, I think it, it, it's unfair to, to have the, the very negative narrative around price delivery from the industry. I think over the last decade, as the strategy for Irish beef and marketing of Irish beef in terms of premiumization in European markets and UK markets uh, has evolved, there has been to delivery on price. Uh, if we look at the current climate, and I know there's an extreme uh, level of sensitivity around beef prices at the moment, I mean, the point is that we are very much in line with where market conditions are at the moment. The price today is equivalent to this time last year. Uh, overall, year to date, price is up 1%. I know they were particularly strong in the midpoint of the year and have come back uh, due to market conditions since the summer. Uh, but price as we stand today is in line with what is happening in the market. It is in line with what's happening on the continent. Uh, and if you look across a lot of the continental markets year on year, as we stand at the moment, their prices are behind. So there's a significant delivery at the moment on price, albeit that I understand farmers are, are frustrated and, and would like to see uh, an increase in price at this time of year and probably expect that there would be some increase. But we have, I suppose, over the last number of months, uh, processed certainly a lot more animals. Um, one clear message that I'm getting for industry is that stock levels held by companies uh, are rising and that's a signal of, of weaker demand in the market. So, you know, despite those challenges, what we are seeing is a stable price. Price has held stable over the last number of, uh, of weeks or even two months, despite a challenging uh, marketplace. And I suppose a lot of focus and comment is made about the UK market. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, the UK market is a very important market to us. But the price comparison with it, I mean, when, when we talk about price gap, there will always be a price gap. In the UK for domestic EU beef or UK beef, there is a premium. That's a premium driven for a domestic product at retail level that has the red tractor, uh, their, their own brand on the product. And, you know, that will guarantee a premium for the British farmer, for British cattle that we will not get. Some of the commentary around the price gap that exists at the moment is exaggerated. The 200 euros. The 200 euros is certainly, okay. certainly exaggerated when you look across the full spectrum of, of beef across steers, heifers, cows, uh, and so on, and, and, and take their relative proportions in the, the mix of animals that we, we process. That, that gap is, is not there. But it is the case that, you know, just three of the top 10 retailers in the UK, uh, stock Irish beef. Uh, that when you know you do the the, the facings at retail level, eighty nine percent of it is British beef. So there there is that gap there, but we're extremely lucky to have it. We continue to 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 have the the British markets on our doorstep. We hope in the longer term, and I'm sure we'll talk about Brexit later on, but we hope in the longer term that that market will still be there to us. It's a, hugely important to the Irish uh, beef industry, but there will be a differential in price between domestic UK product and Irish product. We heard a lot of the speakers there in the BT down in Calvin 
where they're claiming that the, the meat processors, that the factories are profiteering off the backs of farmers. What do you make of those claims? Well, obviously, I, I wouldn't accept those claims at all. Uh, let's let's be clear. I mean, our members are in in the in the business uh, to to make a profit in the the business of beef processing, and that's what any business should be doing. Uh, but that certainly isn't a, a case of profiteering. I think the evidence is there and uh, independently assessed over the years that overall beef processing returns pretty meagre margins overall for the level of investment. There isn't a high level uh, of margin in beef processing or in many aspects of, of the beef chain, regrettably. But to make a, to, to, to make the suggestion that there's profiteering is, is, is totally unfounded and wrong and, and doesn't help. We certainly are an MII members that are processing beef are in the in the business of trying to deliver a sustainable return throughout the chain and we know it can't continue i mean we're we're mutually dependent farmers uh, are dependent on on the the meat processor and processors likewise are dependent on farmers staying in business and we have to work to continue to push on on price delivery in that regard uh, and that's what they do and processors continue to invest invest in their own plants and facilities it's phenomenal you know, every year that you you turn into to, to business, there's there's a new capital investment required just to keep pace with the kind of standards and requirements that are there. Uh, but you know, the margins are not uh, are, are not there in beef processing either. It is a tight, low margin business. But we continue to try to extract more from the market when the market will deliver. And I think if we look at midpoint of this year, prices were very strong. Uh, there was there was delivery in the spring. There was an ability for 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 processors to extract a price from the market. But we did find ourselves at a, at a point when we were well out of tune with the market by mid year, and and hence saw some some fall off in price. But why can't it remain steady? I suppose there, you have to look at a number of things. I mean, we're an export nation. 90% of the beef we're, we're producing is exported, okay? So you're looking, and we're being compared on many occasions, and often we're compared to the UK with a rather level price performance throughout the year, and the, and the level of variation in, in, uh, in, in price is, is not as great as is seen in Ireland. Uh, but that's because they have a strong domestic demand that's an inherent demand that is uh, a 52 week of the year requirement for and let's take the case of the uk requirement for british beef and retailers ensure that they have uh, that product there and and, and it, it gives a more level um, performance on price throughout the year we have i suppose one the fact that we are so export dependent you're you're going into other markets as the the next in line, the imported product, and you're depending on the uh, the, the the surplus or, or deficit that exists in the various markets we service throughout the year, and that gives some volatility. Equally, I suppose, we are, while, while not as excessive as in the past when we had a very seasonal uh, slaughtering, we are seeing, you know, I mean, moves in the in the volume of animals that are coming out at particular times of the year that, you know, puts puts pressure on the system as well. And Cormac, you have acknowledged that some changes are needed on the pricing system. What kind of changes would you propose? Well, I suppose when, when you know, I mean, one, we, we're constantly challenged and rightly challenged on the overall price level, etc. And, and, and that will never change, no matter uh, no matter what month of the year, what year we're in, or, or what farm organization is, is, uh, is, is, is making the, the, the claim we will always be challenged at overall price level. Within pricing, there's an overall return from the market for the beef that we sell, uh, the 560,000 tons of beef that we export, there's an overall return. How that is distributed across the uh, the range of animals between categories and between the different grades, uh, I suppose is is there for, for, uh, for discussion. A number of years ago now, we introduced a, a quality payment system and that was aimed, I suppose, one at improving market signaling, uh, and 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 secondly to differentiate price on the basis of of quality and in favour of the better grading animals. And in particular, it was focused at the at the offspring and the output from the suckler herd. 
So we have heard calls, certainly in recent times, for, for a review around that. And I suppose at this point, Claire, what I'd say is the industry is, is open to that. How it actually progresses, I'm not sure at the moment, but certainly the kind of calls that are there are for, for, for something, you know, some, some recognition that the suckler herd needs uh, needs a, a boost, needs a bolstering, uh, and that's certainly one mechanism through the, the differentials that are there on the on the pricing system. And what about the grading system? Well, the, Do, are changes needed there as well? Well, I think if you're if you're talking specifically around carcass classification and, and grading, um, well, one I think Ireland is out in in the forefront on this in that it has. Uh, almost 100% uh, automated grading across the across the country. So we have adopted uh, up to 14 years ago now, I would say, um, automated carcass classification systems, uh, so that the the grading machine is there in all of the in all of the major plants. Uh, that is delivers. It Yes, yes, I believe so. And, and I think, uh, our, our Department of Agriculture obviously monitors that, uh, on an ongoing basis and is actually, you know, I think there are plans afoot to even have more people involved in that monitoring of it. But it, it is there delivering, you know, it's a comprehensive system. It's, it's objective. It's taken the subjectivity out of it of the, of the human grader and it's delivering uniformity and consistency across the countries. Uh, at the moment, or in the course of this year, there's been some work done in terms of uh, the technology available to move on to, to as we say, future-proof it, if you like, in terms of cameras and lighting and all of that's used just to upgrade the technology to ensure that the system continues to, to operate. But I think it would be wrong to, to suggest that, there's a, that the system isn't working well overall and that the system that we have in Ireland uh, uh, automated objective system that is across all of the plants is, is, is certainly the way to go forward. We, we're a far cry, I think, away from maybe next generation grading down into individual meat yield uh, levels. But, you know, there's always work going on in the future, but that's, that's some way away. So at the moment, what we do is make sure the system we have at the moment works well and make sure that it has the latest equipment and technology and, and there's work going on on that at the moment. There is a lot of worry out there about the impact of dairy expansion as well on the beef site. Um, is dairy beef something that the factories are particularly worried about at the moment? Well, I wouldn't say worried. Uh, it's certainly a new dimension uh, or a changing uh, aspect of the of the industry at the moment with the increased output from the dairy herd and therefore uh, a greater dairy influence in, in the, the beef output. Uh, it's something that we're um trying to address in terms of the quality because certainly there 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 would be issues with the quality and some of the uh the 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 uh terminal sires will say used on the on the dairy herd so we have to focus in on that true breeding and genetics to make sure we get the best quality output from the dairy herd not only in terms of its uh, suitability to the market and the type of animal the weight of animal the, the cut size etc but also to ensure that that the beef finisher or the beef rarer that's that's buying stock from the dairy herd actually is getting an animal that will return uh, or will give them a a, a fair chance at a, at a viable return on that animal. And there are areas that we have to work on there. I think the... Uh, the so is that a matter of patience then? For your well, well, well not, not too much patience. I mean, we have to we have to move on on this because clearly... Uh, you know, this is with us already. We've had dairy expansion. We probably will see more, but we've had a significant expansion in the dairy cow population. And therefore, we're seeing animals coming through already from it. So it's not a case that we can, we can sit and wait. I think we need the, uh, the dairy beef, uh, breed index, uh, that ICBF has, has developed. We need that to be in the, in the system and available so that the type of, you know, where the, where the dairy farmer is selecting uh, a beef sire for for those cows uh, that they're they're selecting an animal that will deliver in terms of a finished animal that will deliver for the beef finisher and also deliver a finished animal that is suitable to the market. So we have to get moving on that with with uh, with with the beef uh, the dairy beef index. Uh, perhaps with some way of ensuring that farmers know, well, if I'm buying that calf, that it has actually come from uh, a bull that has the the the, uh, the relevant beef traits, if you like, that will deliver for him as well as farmer. 
Cormac, what about outlook on price in the in the long term and in the more immediate short term, the Christmas market approaching? Yeah, I suppose in, in, in the long term, and often it's, it's easier to talk about the long term than the short term, but uh, in, in the longer term, I suppose, uh, where we are looking at increased demand, increased demand for protein, and within that beef, uh, finding its place and, 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 and having a, you know, a stronger outlook in the future in, in terms of one, in terms of new markets in Asia that we are trying to, to break into and making some progress on. Um, the longer term for, for us, for the beef industry in Ireland, uh, must be to continue focusing on the European market. I mean, the higher priced European market on our doorstep and hopefully too, that will involve the UK uh, as a, as our near neighbour and a continued outlet for for Irish beef. We we need to continue to focus there. We have a high price production system. We need to be going into markets that are are delivering the highest prices. But equally, we need to take advantage where we can of the new markets, the new growth markets in Asia. We've made some progress recently on China in terms of of eventually getting in there after a lot of work. Um, but that's, that's just at its infancy. I mean, there's a, there's a limited number of plants approved at the moment where, where currently we have applications in for another 12 to 14 plants to be approved. So we can, I suppose, harvest more from the, 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 the cattle population that can go to, uh, to, to China. And we need to then take advantage of, of, of markets like that where consumption and demand is growing, uh, and where it makes sense, where a better return for a particular cut or, or product uh, can be achieved and and use that to feed in to deliver uh, a better return. So I think in in the longer term there is a you know there is a positive. There certainly are some longer term challenges as well in terms of climate change and how we deal with that in terms of meat image and consumption and changing consumer patterns. But overall, I think you can look in looking in the longer term. You're looking at at greater demand and and we have to make sure we're best equipped and have access to where that is happening. In, in the shorter term there, uh, and you mentioned the, the, the lead up to Christmas, I, I suppose if, if, if you looked at the last uh, number of years, you probably would expect to see some price increase as we, as we head towards the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, the sense I have uh, from, from, uh, from the industry is that with the continued strong um, throughput that's coming at us, and I mean, we've only gone through a week where we've been over 40,000 head again, um, there is there is a challenge in seeing any any increase in the in the immediate future. Certainly, there's a strong stock level uh, in in stores. Cold stores are are quite full at the moment. Uh, and while we have a stable price, I think perhaps to see immediate um, positive prospects is 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 more challenging. Um, looking just a bit beyond that, well, you'd hope that. Coming through a year of 2018 when European beef production increased by uh, over 2%, uh, and certainly we saw a big part of that in the second half of the year, some of it attributed to drought, which we had here and across Northern Europe, and saw more beef uh, coming out of the market, increased cullings. Um, hopefully, as the stock level that is in the system washes through, uh, and I think the European Commission's forecast for beef production in Europe in 2019 is for stability rather than increase. Those are positives to look at, uh, and hopefully we'll deliver something uh, in, in as we move into the, into the new year. The great uh, issue, I suppose, out there is what happens on the 29th of March, I mean, in, in terms of Brexit and, and how that plays out. What kind of turbulence will we see in the meantime uh, as we go to that? Because we know that there's still very challenging uh, weeks ahead. I think that was what Theresa May described it as challenging days ahead. But that certainly is the case. How that plays out, how it impacts on sterling, and how we actually find ourselves on the 30th of March is, is certainly a concern. Now, my hope remains, a uh, personal hope is that we will get to uh, either a deal or some shifting of timelines, or, or, or certainly we, we hope to get into a transition period that will give everybody the time that's needed to uh, to adjust. 
come back there's loads of more questions that we would we would be really eager to ask you um but we're just running out of time but finally i just want to know what is your message to a young suckler or beef farmer who is perhaps going around the country to these beef plan group meetings at the moment where there's over 6500 members what is your message to to those young farmers who have quite who are very concerned about their future and the uncertainty around the sector what what message would you give to them what they're they're contemplating leaving the the beef sector I suppose the first thing I'd say is is that I do believe in the Irish beef sector the the Irish beef as a product uh the resilience of it uh the, the, the reputation, the good reputation it has. So we, we, we have a good foundation uh, as, as, a, as a sector uh, in delivering good product. And, and let's be clear, we have good access. We have good markets around us. We need to continue to, as I said earlier, premiumize in, in, in the UK and European markets and continue to, to make inroads on our access to international markets. And like I think those things- premium. Well, well, I'll come to that. I mean, for perhaps a suckler premium, just to deal with it. I mean, yes, there's talk about a suckler premium. We talked earlier, uh, I suppose, in the discussion around whether, you know, whether the payment system reflects more a higher price for for the the better grades that would come from the suckler. I mean, you know. Consumers don't really understand suckler beef. I mean, they understand beef from particular breeds or grass-fed beef, etc. So yeah, getting behind the message and the story of grass-fed specialist beef from family farms is certainly, as, as, as we've recently uh, written in an article, it has been the cornerstone. Suckler has been the cornerstone of much of the progress that has been made for Irish beef in making inroads into the top end customers around Europe. And that's not, and I've said it, it's not a tagline that, that Suckler is the cornerstone. We wouldn't have made that progress uh, in penetrating European markets with, with that, without Suckler beef, and we won't sustain it if there's a reduction in so suckers. So do we need it? So absolutely we do need it. If we end up a with a different if we end up with a different mix in our, in our overall in our overall output of beef then you know we won't sustain those kind of uh, markets. But but you know how how we get to it as I said one mechanism is through uh, through the uh, the differentials, for example, uh, that are there for the different grades, and trying to favour those better grades that come from uh, that come from the uh, the suckler herd. But on, on the wider the point of the, the message to to young young uh, suckler producers, or that is one that there is a there is there is a positivity there in the future. But equally, that you know it is it is a business that they're running and has to be treated like that in terms of taking advantage of all of the technical advice and expertise and breeding that that is there that has been invested in and that can deliver better because that's one one point i'd 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 refer to is that through the bdgp there has been an improvement where whereby our suckler herd was delivering 0.8 of a calf for every cow every year to a move to to 0.87 that's progress at 0.8 it doesn't matter what price we're at if we're not at maximum efficiency it doesn't matter what the price will be and my final piece and my parting piece i suppose there would be for that producer is to engage with a processor or or two to work closely with them and and that is happening on the ground there is you know despite the the overall uh, talk and tone perhaps in the media at times and commentary around the sector the beef sector and and tensions in it at at the ground level between factories and individual processors there are relationships and good relationships and 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 loyalty between them but you know w- working closer with their processor finding out what it is that they are looking for and and the processor knowing what they can deliver and when they can deliver will deliver a better outcome for them. Cormac, we'll leave it there. Thank you again very much for coming in to us. Thank you.